Welcome to uh, Eaton Lecture Auditorium. We're here to talk about media ownership and concentration. So if that's the one you're here for, you're in the right place. Uh, I, we have the good fortune today to have three panelists rather than the expected four. And so upon mutual agreement, the panelists have decided that they would very much appreciate that extra five minutes. So our panelists will uh, start off momentarily. We'll wait for a few people to take their seats. And our first uh, discussant today is John Miller, who is Professor Emeritus uh, at this very institution, Ryerson School of Journalism, former chair, um, money maker, rain maker for the school. His, his, in his years as, was it two decades? Just one decade. Just one decade. Just one decade, two terms. Uh, as chair, he played a foundational role in um, raising funds so that we could, be, we could be housed in this beautiful building, Rogers School of Communications, instead of this somewhat down at the heels theater building that I remember when I was a student. I did not say, I'm Ann Rahala, I'm associate chair of the School of Journalism and a graduate of the Ryerson School of Journalism. Uh, I don't have John's biography up in front of me, but I know that he had a distinguished <coughs> career in journalism and in scholarly activity, and he is an energetic retiree who has not retired from media commentary and analysis. He is author of Yesterday's News on um, Light of journalism would be a, a three-word way of describing it. I, but without further ado, I'd like to in, get John up here and let the ideas start flowing. So will you join me in welcoming John Miller? Thank you. Uh, what I'm, does this work? Yeah. What I what I want to do this uh, this morning is uh, contribute to the local news desert uh, project uh, that April has begun here so successfully and uh, find out what's happening at one local paper uh, over the last 20 years to local news. Uh, it also gives uh, uh, us a, a look inside Canada's biggest newspaper chain, which is Post Media. And for those of you not from here, Post Media owns uh, half of the daily newspapers in Canada uh, many of them are small, 25 of them are small uh, dailies like the one you're about to see. This is the paper I've chosen, mostly because I live there, I know what's going on, um, but uh, it's also very typical of the small dailies that Post Media publishes uh, across Ontario mostly, uh, although they own uh, uh, the, the most of the big papers across Canada. Um, these ones are, are different, uh, different animal. This is in Northumberland today. Uh, it's published about an hour east of here in Port Hope and Coburg. Communities of about uh, 15 to 20,000. Um, there is a local, uh, uh, there is a chain daily that it, it's in competition with. Uh, there's a volunteer local radio station, but no TV. So newspapers are pretty much the game in that town. Um, this uh, is actually a, an amalgamated, uh, it shows up on April's list as, uh, as a news poverty site, but uh, it's a merged paper. Uh, two, two dailies and a, and a weekly were merged into Northumberland today. Um, and uh, uh, I was asking April, how do you know a merged paper is part of the news poverty? Uh, maybe it's a stronger paper, and so I decided to find out. Uh, I, I chose it, uh, sorry, I, I chose it uh, not because of that, that headline uh, that you saw, firefighters in training. Um, they scratch for news uh, uh, a little bit, and um, uh, as, as you'll see, they don't really cover, they cover firefighters in training and with the dynamic shot of the the firefighter training uh, by carrying a dummy down a ladder. 
uh, which is a nice picture, but they overdid it because they have a whole page inside of other firefighters in training carrying other dummies down ladders. Um, I chose it because it's gone through many of the, the ownership changes that Canadian newspapers of that size have gone through in the last several years. Mostly, uh, it's been a daily for 138 years. Um, uh, it, the amalgamated papers had a combined circulation of approximately 8,000 uh, before they merged in 2009. Now the circulation is uh, 2,600, and it's dropping by about 500 a year, I think. Um, it, it's, uh, it was a daily under individual ownership for about 100 years, and then in 1971, it fell under what I call benevolent chain ownership. Uh, benevolent meaning um, uh, the owners that uh, tended to hire good people and they supported good journalism, as opposed to the predatory chain ownerships uh, uh, that took over after them, uh, which didn't do any of those things. They tended to uh, uh, extract resources from the newspaper. Um, and since 2014, post media which uh, is in another category, I would say. We have to invent a word for that kind of chain ownership. Perhaps uh, uh, gnawing off of their own limbs chain ownership uh, might be an appropriate term, or cannibalistic chain ownership. Uh, I also chose the paper because Port Hope happens to be the site of a, na a national ongoing environmental story. Um, that uh, it's the scene of uh, the largest radio, radioactive contamination cleanup in Canadian history, something that's going to cost you and me about $4 billion over the next 10 years. So there's a public interest in having a good, strong local paper to keep an eye on that. A key promise was made in all the ownership changes. I don't really know what it means. Um, Every community affected will continue to enjoy a full diversity of media sources of information. It doesn't say they're actually going to put them in the paper every day. Um, and as we'll see, they, they haven't. Here's what I looked at. Um, it's only a snapshot. I took a week of papers from each of these years uh, and, and put the ruler on the local content and categorized the local content. So it's a quantitative study, uh, mostly, uh, but some qualitative elements came out, and when they came out to me, I went back to the paper for an explanation because I, I didn't quite understand them, and so I'll show you that. In 96, it was a southern owned daily, the old Southern, uh, benevolent Southern. Uh, the paper happened to win the very first National Newspaper Award for local coverage ever awarded. Uh, so it was a very good paper. It was a very good local paper then. And its journalists uh, who did that went on to become uh, deputy editor of the Montreal Gazette or another national newspaper award-winning reporter at the Toronto Star. And uh, I don't see him here, but uh, Rob, Rob, Rob Washburn was a reporter then. He's now a journalism professor at this conference. In 2008, I chose a week there because it was about halfway through the predatory ownership period. And uh, uh, a week uh, this year uh, to just see what has happened with the amalgamated paper and what has happened to local coverage in that. Um, so the snapshot uh, looks something like this for local news. Um, you can see the blue line, which is uh, wire service news in 96 and again in uh, 2008. Uh, this, is, this is percentage of column inches. Um, in the paper for that week. Uh, the wire news in those years was basically um, Horoscope, uh, Dear Abby, uh, and some real estate uh, material, syndicated uh, material for real estate section. Um, as you can see, it shot up to 75% of the content of the paper now, uh, which leads me to believe that it's not a local paper anymore. Uh, the green line is, is actual news of particular interest to uh, Port Hope, and it's declined from about 41% to 6%. And the area news, which is news of uh, surrounding communities, mostly produced by staff, has also declined, but not as much. The big difference between 1996 and 2008 
uh, doesn't look like there's a big difference, but a, a lot of that news, local news content was submitted copy. Um, so businesses sending in announcements, uh, it wasn't really journalism, it was just uh, event listings, uh, business uh, information. And, and uh, the number of Port Hope stories by number has uh, declined to 16 over the course of five days of publishing, which is not a lot of local content. Uh, the, the, the makeup of the, the opinion has also changed. These again are column inches, uh, percentage of column inches. Uh, the, the, the opinion page in 1996 was entirely local. It was even a local cartoon, daily cartoon. Um, uh, and, uh, and there was a robust letters to the editor um, con content. Three and four a day were published and, and frequently contained more news than the rest of the paper um, because they're very um, wonderful letter writers in Port Hope. Uh, that has changed substantially um, in 2017. Uh, there are no letters to the editor, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, and uh, all the editorials and most of the columnists are syndicated uh, out of, uh, out of uh, by Post Media. What's happened to local uh, uh, photographs is even more dramatic, I think. Um, that uh, the, uh, the yellow line is, is where, where pictures of Port Hope. Um, and they've declined from 69% to whatever that is, 9%. Uh, so there's less uh, images of Port Hope in the paper and more syndicated uh, content. So there's a, a marked change in, um, in the content. If we look at numbers of stories, uh, there's a similar pattern of, uh, although there are more stories in the paper, uh, the number uh, of staff byline uh, material is, has fallen dramatically. Number of stories about Port Hope has been um, substantially reduced. And if you look at the opinion category, it's, uh, you know, basically two story, two columns a week are, are jimmied into this syndicated editorial page that's distributed to all the post media papers. Um, I also looked at advertising and um, I thought this is the one figure. You can see the number of ads from businesses in Port Hope has declined uh, incredibly. Um, and, uh, and that uh, uh, all, the, all the editorials are, uh, are syndicated. You remember, Canadians will remember the big fuss over Ken West Global's national editorials. It was a, uh, a it was a major major uh, uh, crisis in Canadian journalism. That's happening at Post Media now, and nobody's raising a peep because it's in smaller papers. Uh, what's interesting is that seventy seven percent of the ad lineage in the paper occurred in one day, uh, on on Thursday when they ran the real estate section. Uh, and, a, and an auto section. And it suggests that it really, this daily paper sh really should be a weekly paper, I think. Uh, research observations. Um, the curious case of no letters to the editor, why is that? Uh, the, the content is free, it's local, it it's, uh, engages the community, uh, but uh, the letter writers have given up. Um, and when I went to the editor, he said, well, we don't receive any. And I said, well, you don't receive any because you don't invite them anymore and you don't tell people where to send them. He says, oh, I'll look into that. Um, so he seemed to be willing to print letters to the editor, but the newspaper has lost this engagement with the public, uh, so they don't come. No local editorials. Um, this editor said he had free reign to replace any of the syndicated material on the editorial page but he didn't do it because of resources. He was just simply too busy. Uh, So-called native content posing as news. This uh, page was uh, written and photographed by a local car dealer who ran a free hockey camp. There, there's a picture of him in the upper right looking jovial and giving away free hockey sticks. Um, and um, and the, the explanation was from the editor says, well, we, we don't really have any guidelines for determining whether 
uh, submitted copy should meets the standards of journalism, and I can't remember ever turning it down. So here's an advertiser who, 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 who has figured it out. He didn't have to pay for this. Uh, makes him look good, and um, he, he in fact doesn't advertise in the paper. Too much syndicated filler. Um, here, every Monday and Friday, uh, approximately two out of 16 pages of the paper are taken up with duplicate crosswords and so on. The, the horoscope is at the bottom. And when I went for an explanation, I expected, he says, well, we gotta give people their horoscopes every day. We don't publish Saturday and Sunday. Um, in actual fact, he said, it's because we have to give them the, the, the solutions to the previous day's crossword, um, which is a very small part of that page. They could easily strip it out, put it in the paper, and fill the rest with news. But again, it's a, it's a resource problem. Uh, I was struck by uh, almost no court uh, uh, police or fire information. And uh, court, court coverage is expensive and time consuming, but police and fire coverage are easy to get. And, um, uh, and he said it was lack of resources, that they didn't cover any of that. Um, curiously, no mention of the newspaper's website in the newspaper. Um, and um, he said, really? No one has ever mentioned that. I'll look into it. And I, I figure, you know, because a lot of the content of the paper actually appears on the website first, I said, uh, this is a unique uh, strategy. They're keeping the website a secret. So people will buy the newspaper. Isn't that wonderful? Nobody's ever thought of that. Anyway, this fits into uh, four worrisome trends. Uh, that are facing papers like this, concentration of ownership uh, is, is pretty uh, serious. 55% uh, of the community papers in Canada are owned by 10, 10 chains. Uh, there, there have been closings, as there have been um, um, with dailies. Advertising has, has fallen through the trap door. Uh, the federal government no longer advertises in print, for instance, and that was traditionally the, the biggest um, advertiser for newspapers. And the quality, um, this is John Hondrick uh, talking. He says there's a crisis of uh, declining good journalism in Canada that's most often felt at the local level. Uh, there's perhaps another worrisome trend. Um, when um, news uh, goes online, uh, the newspaper tends to disappear. And that's a long range problem. Uh, I've got uh, some questions that arise out of my readership that perhaps I'm offering up for maybe later today when uh, we're going to try to draw this together. Uh, I don't know that uh, similar research conducted elsewhere would show the same trends. Um, I don't know that chain ownership is the main contributing factor to this. I suspect it is in, in the post-media papers of this size in Ontario, but uh, that needs to be uh, determined. Uh, the hard one is, what are the implications for local democracy and civic dialogue if the, the, the local newspaper, uh, which uh, in this case Northumberland Today advertises itself as the number one news source for Northumberland County, uh, what, what happens if it doesn't have local opinion and uh, a letter C editor? and what policy options might be considered. One of the ones that occurred to me was, um, you know, if chain ownership is causing this uh, to happen in these communities where there's no other sources of news, could a case be made for banning chain ownership in communities under a certain uh, population size because uh, they're so vital to the community? Uh, Post Media has, uh, has cut back uh, not only its news, newsrooms, but also their, their publisher. This paper doesn't have a publisher anymore, and a lot of their papers don't have. Instead, they have regional managers. Um, and uh, as we know, the, the, the role of the publisher in many papers is to make inroads with the community and have associations with the community. And is this having an impact on the newspaper's relationship to other local institutions? 
and what, what role should small papers play in, in, in fostering community dialogue? Um, or is, is, is that been, is, will that be taken over by social media? So those are some questions and uh, I look forward to, uh, to kicking this around with you the rest of the day. Our next guest is Adam Jeno from the University of Wroclaw's Institute of Journalism and Social Communication. He, Adam is an editor of and advisor to the Polish European Journalism Observatory. He is a former radio and TV reporter, and his interests, as we will discover, are on Polish, the Polish press market with an emphasis on ownership and market concentration. Would you join me in welcoming him, please? Thank you very much for this introduction, Anne. It is a big pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'm representing the University of Wrocław, especially the Institute of Journalism and Social Communication. We have about 2,000 students, so it is probably more than all over Canada, I think. So we have two fields. One field is journalism and second, communication management. So I'm uh, fully uh, overloaded with didactics because I have something like 500 hours uh, of teaching per, per year. So this is, this is what I normally do. So, but uh, in the meantime, I'm trying to focus on uh, what's going on in the regional press in Poland. So and I'm giving some thoughts about it to you today. But as probably uh, most of you are not very familiar with the Polish media system, I'm giving just a short feedback and uh, some uh, general thoughts. Uh, this is nothing probably unique in many countries. This is a kind of umbrella uh, system. So we, ha we have uh, nationwide newspapers, TV, radio stations, some regional, a bit uh, more numbers uh, of regional uh, news uh, outlets. And then local media and the triangles are sub-local media. We do not use the term hyper-local, we use rather sub-local media, and as you may see, sub-local and local media, it is a huge variety. There are hundreds of uh, these uh, entities in Poland. They also com compete uh, uh, with each other and also to some extent with the regional and uh, nationwide uh, media. This is how Poland looks like, and uh, believe it or not, we are pretty the same as Canada when it comes to uh, citizenship. So the number of, of people living in Poland is 38 million people. So it's a big bit uh, more than in Canada. But when it comes to the area, we are squeezed 28 times. So that that's means something. And uh, more or less, uh, especially when it comes to the press, um, um, the structure of press market is somehow fitted to administra administrative levels. So that's why I gave you this kind of notion on the uh, uh, down left corner. So we have 16 voivod ships, so-called region in other countries, then uh, more than 300 poviats. This is a middle size uh, unit. And the uh, communes, which is probably something you know, uh, two and, and a half uh, thousand communes. So in each third commune, we have a local newspaper or sub-local newspaper. So the media system, especially when it comes to the press, is somehow fitted to the administration levels in Poland. And this is a kind of uh, basics when it comes to informational media in Poland. I'm just giving you the notion how uh, Maybe uh, to comparison to what's going on in Canada, I've been talking to, to some of your colleagues and uh, to my astonishment, there are some several um, um, same patterns when it comes, for example, to radio markets. There is not a huge variety of uh, radio competitors in Canada. In Poland also it's like this. So when it comes to the 
local press, it is a huge variety. We have almost 3,000 titles, and of which 650 we may call independent press. But these are not dailies. These are weeklies or monthlies. Then we have this regional dailies, which I'm going to describe a little bit more. 23 all over the country, and uh, 20 of them are in German's hands, namely Verlagsgruppe Passau, subsidiary of this company is Polska Press. And this is a hot issue nowadays in Poland. And uh, we have about 20, uh, 12 dailies, but these are very different. Two tabloids, two broadsheets, one uh, uh, very rightist, four economics, two sports, and one free. When it comes to radios, we have only 50 independent local radio stations, which is very few when it comes to 38 million people living there. Uh, 17 departments of Polish public radio, which is also uh, somehow supporting the role of local media. And four great channels when it comes to radio, the Polish radio channel number one and three, and the even bigger stations in private hands, in German, Germans or French hands, RMF and Radio Z. When it comes to local TV, we barely have any professional local TV in Poland. These are five stations uh, located on so-called Maxis, multiplexes, L1, 2, 3, 4, and 7. Uh, of course, there are some operators in cable, but these are barely any professionals. And uh, also we have 16 departments of regional uh, Polish television. And uh, when it comes to nationwide level, we have so-called G4, grade four, the, the biggest uh, channels. Two uh, uh, are given by the Polish television, number one and two, and two entrepreneurs, one is Polish, and the second was uh, a year ago uh, taken over by uh, Scripps Network Interactive from the States. So this is how uh, the system, uh, media system in, in Poland is shaped. And now I'm going to talk about regional dailies because this is a, uh, an issue of my uh, presentation. So what we may say in uh, general about the regional uh, press in Poland, uh, it is the last level which operates on basis, uh, on a daily basis. So below the regional level we don't have, we don't have daily, daily news when it comes to the uh, the press. Um, uh, it also supports readers with local news because they, uh, each week they have something like supplements and uh, some of the newspapers have even 30 supplements each week. Each weekend before each weekend they, they spread all over the region different supplements. Uh, this uh, segment is not numerous but very distinctive uh, because of these two things I mentioned before. And uh, to some extent, we may call it it's between a Sila and uh, Caribbean because from one point side, we have national dailies, which are quite you know, influential and uh, with uh, big support, financial support. On the other hand, we have plenty full of uh, local media, local newspapers, hundreds. So this is something regional dailies uh, have to cope in the mean, in, in, in between. And, uh, well, the sledgehammer, political sledgehammer, arrived uh, in 2015 as uh, the conservative uh, party, Law and Justice, won two elections. And uh, as a result, there were some several amendments to the media law in Poland, especially it touched uh, public media, which were transformed into national media. And it was a strong politicization of the media. And also some several sweep out in public media were carried out. And uh, now uh, it might be called it is an instrument of propaganda. So these national media, which were previously public media. But when it comes to regional dailies, we are talking about repolonization. That's an, a new idea from politicians of the conservative party. Uh, and they are trying to think about uh, changes in the law. And uh, finally, a couple months ago, there was an email from Mark Deacon, uh, Ringer, Axel Springer chief, uh, and also co-owner of some of uh, Polish media out outlets. Uh, he was talking about the re-election of Donald Tusk in the European Union uh, presidential post, 
and uh, for some rightist uh, media it was uh, uh, perceived as a scandalous manual and uh, farther on it was parliamentary discussion and of course uh, politicians from current government are th uh, thinking about media ownership law to be changed. Well, uh, of course, what is happening in Poland is a kind of, you know, featured by what's going on in all over Europe and even in the States. So uh, you probably recognize all of the politicians which are somehow connected with uh, what's going on in media in Poland. So as we are, as we are a member of European Union since the f uh, 1st of May 2004, uh, we somehow uh, reflect what's going on in France, Marine Le Pen in uh, Hungary, Viktor Orban, and of course, to some extent, some politicians in Poland are trying to uh, take the footsteps of uh, Vladimir Tsar Putin. So, um, and that is why um, politicians from lower justice, so current government, is thinking about retaking regional dailies in Poland. Um, so in the press and in the, on the internet, you could find uh, articles about how many media outlets are you know, in German's hands and for politicians, it's very nice and hot issue. Now we should do something with this. And it, it appeals to public opinion and especially, of course, for the people who are supporting uh, the current government. And uh, finally, of course, we are dealing with all the problems uh, you uh, also the, uh, the professor mentioned. Uh, each year we have a steady decrease when it comes to uh, print run and sale. These are all uh, regional dailies in Poland. And as you may see, dynamics is two digit regress uh, comparing 2016 to 2015. So this is, this is what we are uh, dealing with. So what is the future of regional dailies in, in Poland? Uh, as you may observe, the circulation and sales uh, data proves that the, the, the regional press, the press segment uh, diminish, and uh, this is something we, we need to handle with. And this two-digit decrease is a kind of steady trend. It's nothing new. It's uh, something like lasting for a couple of years, and we do not expect that it's going to change. As a result, some of the regional titles may disappear in the long run, and uh, others might be transformed, like you also mentioned, uh, this kind of mergers in between, especially if the owner is the same and has, uh, for example, two newspapers in one region. So this is trouble, trouble situation. And uh, in the worst scenario, which should be mentioned here, when the current government uh, will try to retake uh, regional dailies from Germans' hands, it is possible that they will find out some chap who will be the new owner of this. And this was the case in Czech Republic. So the Velas Wupepasa, who was the, the owner of original dailies in, in Czech Republic, just sold it out to Penta, uh, Czech Slovak group, uh, which is now the owner of, of majority of uh, regional and uh, local media in, in Czech Republic. So this might be also the scenario in, in Poland. But in the long run, and this is my hypothesis, in the long run, if, uh, if they succeed in uh, t retaking this, uh, this segment of media in Poland, in my opinion, it might disappear because it will never go back to the free market because running by some politicians or associates, it, uh, it means that it will disappear in the long run. Well, what is the future also of uh, regional media? Uh, I think there is no other option than spread the news online. So this is what we observe globally in, in Canada as well, probably. But I think that only paywalls or other forms of paid access to the content is, is something which might uh, try and help to you know, survive them in the long run. We may observe huge number of clicks, view pages. Some of the original dailies in Poland have even more than 20 million view pages per month. This is, of course, this is a very nice uh, number, but still, it does not feed the newsroom. Yeah. So, 
Uh, there is an obvious necessity, in my opinion, also for uh, web responsive design applications connected with an easy payment systems. It has to be fitted to the needs and uh, you know, possibilities of the recipients. This is the only way. How can they handle with, uh, with the situation, which is not terribly good? And also video content, I mean clips, not, not like TV coverage, but some kind of clips, uh, video clips may also help, but this cannot be a kind of replacement for a good journalistic staff. So I think this is still something which is uh, valuable for the, for the audience. Let me draw some of the conclusions about the future of regional dailies in Poland. Regional daily dailies are wanted by readers, but lately even more by politicians. One of the prospects is the nearest uh, local authority elections uh, this year. So probably current government is thinking, okay, these regional dailies, they operate on daily basis. So it is really nice instrument in which we can have a handicap over some other competitors on the political scene. So that is probably uh, their intention in retaking it, and they use this, you know, keywords, hot soundbite, repolonization. You know. and there is a huge variety in the regional media segment. It was said on the previous panel, there is no one local or even one regional market. This is something very different. You may pick one regional daily in one uh, region in Poland, which has something like 30,000 daily copy sale, and on the other corner you have something which sale only 3,000. And it's very hard to combine and to compare this. So if you are going into some compar comparative study or research, you need to take it into consideration that some of these regional dailies are not truly regional. Even their um, uh, spread is not, uh, not regional, mainly focused on uh, medium-sized cities, for example, or big cities, not uh, all over the, the region. Uh, threatening influence on regional media content by foreign companies, in my opinion, is exaggerated. Moreover, there is no hard evidence for this. I haven't seen any deep study or uh, analysis, content analysis, which could prove that, for example, Germans are trying to influence public opinion in Poland. So this is something very catchy for politicians, but honestly not proved in uh, deep research. And uh, there is no uh, such uh, evidence for manipulative intentions of uh, the owners from Germany. However, it's still worth uh, analyzing and observing what's going on because you know the, 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 the situation is flux and uh, still we may, uh, we may expect some different, different uh, policies and, and movements from the from current government. And what was said by one of um, uh, media researchers, and I mm, go for it, regional dailies in Poland are still one of the essential media with integrate local communities and prove the daily economic, cultural, and social life. And it would be a shame if politicians had spoiled it. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you so far, speakers, for making my work so simple. People finishing right on the moment that they're supposed to finish. Our next speaker is Dr. Mark Edge, who is an associate professor of media and communication at the University of Malta. He is now, he has taught universities in five countries. He was a professor of media and communication at University Canada West in Vancouver. He also is a former journalist, a sailor. <laughs> hey, he mentions sailing on his bio all the time, so I had to mention sailing. Um, he was an uh, endowed faculty scholar in journalism at California State University in Fresno and author of five books, including Pacific Press, Red Line, Blue Line, Bottom Line, and most recently, Greatly Exaggerated. His fifth book, 
was just published in 2016, The News We Deserve. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Edge. Thank you uh, for that, Anne. I should point out that um, I'm actually going back to University of Canada West to teach in the summer, so I'm now one of these people with two affiliations, one on uh, each side of the pond. It's much too hot in Malta in the summer, apparently, in the mid-30s, so I'll be back in the, in the cool of uh, British Columbia on my boat. Uh, for those of you who are uh, not familiar with my research, uh, I have been studying uh, media ownership and concentration uh, for about the past 20 years, mostly uh, newspaper ownership and concentration, uh, but I've been branching out uh, into other media, uh, mostly Canadian media, but I've now been branching out into other countries. Uh, before I did that, I, I was a newspaper journalist for about 20 years, so I, I like to think I have an understanding of the industry from the inside out. Um, and uh, my, my research took a bit of a turn about uh, well, it was 2011 when I was selected for a fellowship uh, to the Reynolds Business uh, Journalism Center at Arizona State University, uh, where they gave us um, training in uh, things including reading financial statements. And um, it was hard to believe that I had by then written two books about media corporations and hardly cracked an annual report. And uh, once I started, I couldn't stop. It, there's just a wealth of uh, information in there. Uh, my uh, 2014 book greatly exaggerated the myth of the death of newspapers. What I did was I went uh, through the annual reports of all of the publicly traded newspaper companies in Canada and the U.S. In Canada, it's about 75% of the industry. Uh, it's the U.S., it's about 40%. And I went back to 20, uh, 2006 before uh, the recession and found that an, on an operating basis, that is money coming in the door, money going out the door, none had declared an annual loss, uh, despite the screaming headlines about uh, $100 million losses. Those are all on paper. Uh, so when Post Media uh, announces it lost $352 million last year, that's only if you include a $367 million write-down on the value of their asset. Uh, they actually made $82 million last year. Unfortunately, 72 million of which went to pay the interest on their loans, which is mostly held by their hedge fund owners, uh, mostly U.S. hedge funds. Anyway, uh, even the uh, newspaper companies that went into bankruptcy, including CanWest Global, were nicely profitable, uh, some uh, wildly so, 20% or more. Their problem was the debt that they had taken on in making acquisitions before the recession hit. Uh, which dropped their revenues uh, well by about half in the U.S. and by about a third in Canada. But let's just say that the newspaper chains have been playing this for all it's worth, uh, seeking uh, government uh, um, help, regulatory breaks. Uh, ben Bagdikian uh, detailed in his book, The Media Monopoly, what he called the myth of newspaper poverty, which newspaper publishers have exploited for decades. For example, in the U.S., they're the only industry outside of Major League Baseball which has an exemption from the antitrust laws. And uh, I still believe the myth of newspaper poverty is alive and well, uh, maybe more so than ever. Uh, in Canada, I believe the myth of the death of newspapers is uh, even uh, more extant. It's very greatly exaggerated. Um, my favorite here was the Shattered Mirror report. You can read on the right there, the second paragraph. In total, six daily newspapers either closed, merged, or reduced their publication schedules in 2016, bringing to 36 the number that have done so since 2009. That's the highest number I found. John mentioned 27. That's the number I've come up with. Uh, only about half of these, however, are paid. Uh, daily newspapers, uh, the rest are free circulation or computer, commuter tabloids or um, controlled circulation. Uh, the Department of uh, Canadian Heritage, even in announcing its um, ongoing hearings into media and local communities, uh, gave the number of 20 out of 122 daily newspapers 
uh, have closed in the past five years. Oh my goodness, that's fully one in six. We've got newspapers folding left, right, and center. Later that year, the Globe and Mail came up with the 27 number. Uh, editor and publisher most recently uh, published a figure of 171 local news outlets, which apparently has come out of some research done at this school, doesn't uh, distinguish between newspapers, uh, broadcasting, or online. So with all these newspapers dying in Canada, I'm wondering if anybody can tell me the name of one of them. Yes. Ralph Mercury, very good. Everybody knows that one, because of course it happened in southern Ontario and made a lot of headlines. Yes. Um, can anybody tell me another one? Well, yes, it's in the PowerPoint. This is what I do for my students. The answer is in the PowerPoint, <laughs> if you pay that close attention. And uh, usually things that happen out on the west coast of uh, Canada, where I'm from, don't usually make the news here. But this happened about the same time as the Guelph Mercury uh, went out of business. So let's take a look at what happened in Nanaimo, because it's very interesting. And I think it's indicative of what's been going on out there. The Nanaimo Daily News was a very long publishing daily newspaper. Uh, back in the 19th century, Nanaimo was actually a bit of a boom town on Vancouver Island. Uh, it's a coal mining uh, country, and now it's mostly a haven for retirees, uh, mostly from colder parts of Canada. It was uh, acquired by the Southern newspaper chain in the uh, early decades of the 20th century. Southern, of course, went through a number of ownership changes from Hollinger after it was taken over by Conrad Black to Can West Global Communications, which was the subject of my third book, Asper Nation, um, in 2000. And then Can West went bankrupt in 2009. So its newspaper division was bought by a consortium of its creditors called Post Media Network with financing from these US hedge funds. Um, they didn't really want all these um, smaller newspapers in British Columbia, so they sold most of them to a company called Glacier Media. Glacier Media, uh, believe it or not, started its life as a bottled water company, hence the name. Uh, started up by a fellow named Sam Grippo, who made a lot of money in Vancouver real estate. And they got into the newspaper business because uh, they thought they could make a lot of money. And well, uh, anyway, uh, Glacier, already owned a weekly newspaper called the Harbor City Star, so that gave them two newspapers in Nanaimo. They turned around and sold both of them to Black Press, which owned the third newspaper in town. So at this point, there were three newspapers in Nanaimo, one daily, one weekly, and one twice weekly. Um, the Black Press, which I should point out has no relation to Conrad Black, it's owned by a fellow named David Black, uh, operated out of Victoria. Uh, I'll go into the bit of the corporate detail in a moment. Um, it decided to first close the news bulletin, which it uh, originally owned, the Twice Weekly, um, in 2015, and then uh, last year closed the uh, Daily News. So at one point, they had three newspapers. They could choose which one they wanted to keep, which ones they wanted to close. They kept the weekly. Uh, obviously, the costs would be a lot less in producing uh, a weekly newspaper. And I'm sure that from their market research, uh, their intimate uh, familiarity with the advertisers in the region, they were pretty sure they could soak up most of the available advertising dollars. This is something that's been going on out in BC for a number of years now. Ever since 2010, uh, I've gone through the list of all the Newspapers that have been closed. Let's start with the paid dailies. Uh, starting in 2010, the Prince Rupert Daily News, another former Southern newspaper, sold to Glacier, then sold to Black, which already owned a, uh, I think it's twice weekly newspaper there. Uh, a few days later, they closed it. Nelson Daily News, another long publishing former Southern Daily, exactly the same thing. Had been sold to Glacier, Gl Glacier sold it to Black. A few days later, Black closed it. Uh, here you can see in 
2013, we had a couple of uh, unrelated, uh, not closures, but um, publication frequency changes. Portage La Prairie and Amherst, um, Nova Scotia went weekly. Then we get back to British Columbia, a fairly major daily newspaper, the Kamloops Daily News, was closed. Uh, I should point out that most of these dailies, long publishing dailies that have been closed, have been unionized operations, therefore have higher cost of production. The weeklies and twice weeklies tend to be more non-union. Um, Glacier, uh, there, there's a twice weekly publication in Kamloops as uh, they pr have proliferated around the interior of BC called uh, Kamloops This Week. It's part of a chain. It's not owned directly by Glacier, but by an affiliated company called Aberdeen uh, Publications. Um, same thing in Dawson Creek. Well, that went, that was, that merged. That merged with the um, Alaska Highway News, I believe. But the same thing happened on um, Vancouver Island with the Alberni uh, Valley Times in Port Alberni. Black uh, bought it from Glacier. They already had the Port Alberni Valley uh, News, I think it is, so they closed the, their acquired competition. Uh, the Guelph Mercury we just talked about, apparently a same dynamic there that uh, Metroland owned another newspaper it was in competition with and only wanted one. There's not a lot of money in competition, but there's still some money in Monopoly. Uh, the Alaska Highway News went weekly, uh, and then just uh, last year, the Cranbrook Daily Townsman, uh, Kimberly Daily Bulletin went weekly, um, and finally Fort McMurray today in northern Alberta. So these are the 13 daily newspapers, paid daily newspapers, uh, that are no longer with us since 2010, but only eight of them um, are no longer with us. The others are uh, either weekly or emerged with another newspaper. Um, but six out of the eight owned by Black Press and Glacier Media traded back and forth. Uh, let's uh, now move to the free daily newspapers closed. Uh, there are two types of those. There are the commuter tabloids that are given away at um, um, uh, subway stations, uh, bus stops. Um, these proliferated about a dozen years ago when Metro International, a Swedish company, came to Canada with their very successful model and partnered with uh, Torstar, I believe. Um, CanWest and Quebec or uh, Panicked started their own free giveaways 24 hours in the case of uh, Quebec or Dose in the case of CanWest, which led to some very bad jokes. It didn't last very long, but in some places we had no fewer than three new daily newspapers. Most of these have since fallen by the wayside, especially since the recession, uh, because a lot of the advertising revenue has dried up, and the free newspapers, of course, they don't have the option of raising their cover prices because they, they give them away for free, and so they're totally reliant on advertising. So you can see here, of these 14 free dailies that have been closed, I believe six of them are free commuter tabloids, were free commuter tabloids, Metro Regina, Metro Saskatoon, Metro London. Uh, I think uh, it was John Miller who I quote in my most recent book, which is available downstairs at the book table. Uh, these are commuter tabloids, and small towns like London do not have extensive commuter systems. So why would you think such a newspaper would succeed in the first place? So other than these commuter tabloids, take a look at where all of the rest of the newspapers... BC, guess who owns them or owns them? Yes, Black Press and Place Your Media. These two chains have been doing business uh, since 2010, buying, selling, even trading back and forth uh, newspapers and then often closing them to eliminate competition. All under the watchful eye, of course, of the Federal Competition Bureau, which has done nothing. Uh, Black Press of Victoria, like I say, is owned by a fellow named David Black. Uh, uh, it's a private company, so we c we, uh, it's not required to publish annual reports, but it's partly owned by Torstar, uh, and so we can get a glimpse into their financials, which we'll look at it in a moment. 
as a result. Black Press owns two daily newspapers and 88 community newspapers, mostly in BC, but also in Alberta, also in Washington State and California, and in fact, they've acquired a couple of major metropolitan daily newspapers in the US, in Honolulu, where they merged the Star Bulletin and the Advertiser, it's now the Star Advertiser, also the Akron um, Daily News, I think it is. As a result of all these um, uh, swaps of newspapers, Black Press now owns all non-daily newspapers on Vancouver Island, where it's headquartered. Uh, Glacier Media, which is uh, based out of Vancouver, owns the only major metropolitan daily uh, on Vancouver Island, the Times Colonist. Now uh, the publisher is David Radler, and the speculation is he'll be taking it off their hands. Of course, the convicted felon, uh, henchman of Conrad Black. Um, Glacier Media owns three dailies and 59 community newspapers. It is a public company, uh, so we can uh, uh, at least take a look at their financials. It's sometimes harder to unravel them. It's a company, like I say, it was started up by a real estate magnate. It's operated by a Harvard MBA, a for former investment banker named John Kennedy. John L. Kennedy, not John F. Kennedy. Um, uh, I don't believe he has any previous experience in journalism. Uh, since 2010, these two chains have carved up the community newspaper uh, ownership in British Columbia, uh, buying, selling, even trading back and forth community newspapers, then, like I say often, uh, closing them, em eliminating competition. The number is now up to 20 newspapers, which they have closed as a result of their dealings, including, like I say, six of the eight paid daily newspapers closed in Canada since 2010. In one blockbuster deal that they did in 2014, they traded no fewer than 15 newspapers back and forth, uh, more than half of which have now been closed to eliminate competition. This is classic anti-competitive behavior. Buy your competition close it. Uh, this is uh, clearly tit for tat, quid pro quo stuff, and yet the Competition Bureau does nothing. Well, you're probably saying to yourselves, but newspapers are dying, they're falling on hard times, they have to let them do these sorts of things. Well, yes and no. Uh, Glacier Media, I've been tracking their profits for a, a while now. Uh, my 2014 book, uh, greatly exaggerated, by the way, you can download for free on my website just markedge.com. We have made the PDFs of all of my previous books um, free for download, still trying to sell the most recent one, so you can just get the introduction to that one. And until the uh, recent recession, or I guess it's not so recent anymore, hard to believe, it's 2009, um, they were making very nice profit margins of 20% plus, like most newspaper companies, fell somewhat to 15 or 18% return on revenue is the measure we use. By the way, who can tell me what the average return on revenue or profit margin for, uh, say, a Fortune 500 company might be? It's a single digit. 4.7%. Yeah. yeah. So only about triple or quadruple uh, <laughs> the average profit margin for a uh, company. Um, so in late 2013, they announced this program of cost cutting, uh, as a result of which profit blipped up to 14% in 2014 down a little bit the next year, but now uh, their latest annual report, it's up to 15.6%. Well, um, I believe it's not just due to cost cutting, but also some uh, corporate shenanigans. Uh, the newspapers they've been closing have died not so much as a result of natural causes, but as a result of premeditated murder, uh, as a result of corporate connivance. Black Press, like I say, is a private company, is thus not required to disclose its earnings. However, Torstar bought a uh, share, about one-fifth share, 19.4% a few years ago. So they mention it briefly in their annual reports. And if you uh, divide its slice of their earnings by 0.194, uh, you can extrapolate the earnings of Black Press, which, again, um, went down with the recession, 
uh, I don't have them before 2011, but as you can see, they've gone up and up and down and down, and now they're back up to where they were before. So I believe this is one of the ways these two chains have bolstered their earnings, not just through cost cutting, but by eliminating competition. Like I say, much more money in monopoly. Um, the problem is this is happening way out on the west coast where I come from, and, and nobody much notices here in the center of the universe in southern Ontario. Um, but I've been trying to make as much noise about it as I can. Um, the Competition Bureau has been totally ineffective. It was uh, formed about 30 years ago to replace a very ineffective antitrust regulator, the Restrictive Trade Practices Branch, which never successfully challenged a newspaper merger. Uh, the Competition Bureau did, actually in its very early years, after Southern bought up most of the community newspapers in Vancouver, the Competition Bureau ordered them to divest a half dozen of them. Uh, Southern uh, appealed to a competition tribunal, tribunal and then actually all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, managed to get it reduced down to one. Um, anyway, the Competition Bureau, of course, turned a blind eye to Post Media's acquisition of uh, Sun Media. Of course, they swore up and down they would never merge the newspapers or merge the newsrooms, but of course what happened as soon as they got federal approval or the newsroom. So I believe the Competition Bureau has been nothing less than derelict in its duty. Uh, and something should be done. So this is why uh, when they announced that they were merging the newsrooms, I blew my stack and did something that I've never done before, which is take action. I've been writing about these things for about 15 years. I started thinking, who might have the power to do something about this? It was shortly after the new liberal government came into power, power. So I decided to go see my local MP, Hetty Fry. Gave her a copy of my 2014 book, which showed the newspapers were all still making money. Oh, she thought, she said, I thought they were losing them. Well, that's what everybody thinks. I gave her a copy of my first book on Pacific Press, the uh, partnership between the Vancouver Sun and Province, which shows how they promised back in the 1950s to always keep separate newsrooms. Whatever happened to that? Dr. Fry was as outraged as I could have hoped, and a few weeks later, they began these hearings in Ottawa, been ongoing ever since. I'm hopeful something might come out of it, but since the publication of The Shattered Mirror, I, I'm beginning to despair that there's some sort of agenda at work here. I wonder what it might be. Uh, I could go on and on about this, but maybe we can save that for a question period. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, we have about 15 minutes left for questions or conversations. I think I would like to invite each of our three speakers first to ask uh, if they have questions of each other after, after what we've heard. Yeah, well, that's. I'm also wondering. I think it might be more useful if you sat at the table. We have and you have microphones. Looks like we have a questioner. While you get yourselves settled, interesting, provocative, con both or extraordinary similarities and overlaps, but also some fascinating paradoxes and contradictions in what we've heard this morning. Yes, sir, go ahead, please. Hi there, question for John and for Mark. Uh, I'm Martin O'Hanlon, I'm president of CWA Canada, the media union, also a longtime journalist with Canadian Press. So we've been pushing very hard, uh, ineffectively, to the, for the federal government uh, to do a couple of things. Um, one of them is to break up the post-media monopoly, do something about it, whether through a, a law or regulation. And the other is to introduce some kind of regulation to stop the scam of having hedge funds uh, allow a heavily indebted company to buy something just to feed the money back to the hedge fund. So the company is doomed to failure post-media before it started. It's, it's purely a, a funneling of money from, from a company to the hedge funds. So we've been pushing hard at the federal government. They're doing absolutely nothing on that front. Seriously, do you think there's any mechanism that can make the federal government take action here? And what, what can we do about it? 
Uh, it's a good question. Um, if I had the answer, I wouldn't be here talking for nothing. I'd be <laughs> renting myself out. Um, but um, I think what I see in the post media small papers that I looked at, or the small paper I looked at, if that's going on across the system, they may do it to themselves. They may divest their, their smaller papers uh, and concentrate on the on the big pa papers, which bring in a lot of a lot of cash flow that they can pay off their investors. It also reduce their debt somewhat. So I think the, I think what's going to happen is is maybe there's going to be a deal. Most obvious partner would be Metroland, um, and and what we saw. What Mark so graphically showed us in BC is going to happen in Ontario, that they're going to uh, buy papers and close them. And so uh, that's going to occupy most of the attention uh, for the next little while. In terms of regulations um, and the federal government, um, uh, I still don't know. I haven't read a good account of how Post Media managed to convince them that it was still a Canadian company. Uh, the fact that there hasn't been any uh, action this far indicates that nobody's interested and, and that uh, it, re it will remain a, a loophole. I, I think I wish you the best in convincing them otherwise, but I, I just don't think, think that even the Liberal government now has, a, has an interest in, in delving into that rat hole of uh, regulatory... Um, uh, you know, because it's very complicated. I, I, I don't think there are votes in it for them, and I don't think they'll do it. Mark may have a different view. I'm actually hopeful. If you look at the history of media uh, reform attempts uh, in this country, they've mostly failed because they've been initiated by a liberal government, and then by the time they've reported, it's been a conservative government either uh, incoming or already in place. This is why Kent failed, because the liberals were on their way out. Uh, this is why the 2006 um, Senate hearings on um, news media uh, failed because by the time they finally reported, uh, Stephen Harper was in uh, power and he wasn't about to regulate the media, especially as uh, you know most of the big chains were his political supporters. So it's like I told Hetty Fry, you've got a chance to do something that Davy couldn't do, that Kent couldn't do, that Bacon couldn't do. Uh, and that's why I'm hopeful, but uh, like I say, this latest shattered mirror thing gives me a bit of pause because uh, think tanks have an agenda, and uh, it's like Donald Trump. You can tell whose pocket he's in by who he doesn't criticize, uh, and there was no criticism of post media or foreign ownership or hedge fund ownership, and I think they're angling for a bailout. Well, when it comes to the Central East European countries, there are some similarities. As I said, as I said it's uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, and uh, I think also Romania, that uh, in uh, these countries, uh, Reiner, which is a Swiss company, and, and uh, Axel Springer from Germany and other German companies are quite, uh, quite uh, present. And that was just due to lack of uh, regulations, law regulations, because in, the, in those countries there was no limits for foreign companies. So, uh, mm, which is not the case in other countries. For example, now the government in Poland is trying to see, okay, maybe we should have taken the footsteps of Germany or France. Well, there are some hard regulations and there is anti-monopoly offices and trade, you know, law which uh, somehow regulates uh, quite strictly who might be the owner and what is the percentage of the ownership. So this is what we are just now directing and watching for, but I don't think it's an easy uh, easy step as it was in the case of Russia when just the Tsar Putin said, okay, now we don't want Axel Springer or American companies, so we just limit 
foreign company shares to 20%, and almost every foreign company withdrew from, uh, from Russia in 2016. So I don't think this might gonna happen in Poland. I don't think so. Paul Adams from Carlton. Um, I have a slightly, just to begin with, a slightly different take on what's going on in Ottawa in policy terms, including Shattered Mirror, which is I think that uh, the policy uh, orientation of Heritage Canada right now is that there's going to be a crisis when post media goes into bankruptcy protection or bankruptcy, and they're trying to equip themselves with policy tools because they have no idea what they're going to do when that happens, but they think there will be a, a crisis that they're going to have to confront. And part of what was happening with Shard Shattered Mirror, in my view, was they threw some money at a think tank to begin the process of generating policy options w without denying for a moment that the particular people who, were, who staffed that um, report were had a certain agenda, I'm not, but what I'm saying is I think that now in policy terms, what Heritage is consumed with is not addressing post-media, its ownership, you know, the, the hedge funds and all that. That's all taken as a given and that there's going to be some sort of crisis in the, in, in the near term and they're going to have to react to it. But I, I uh, actually came to the mic because I wanted to ask John a question about, so what happens to the news environment there when that paper changes hands or I, like is it you think simply that the paper will be shut down by Torstar for example or, or are there digital options is things are going to just disappear I'm, I'm just thinking in a post post media environment what happens where you live yeah well I was uh, we faced this before in our community um, uh, when Conrad Black bought Southam uh, and all of a sudden, he owned the Porto Evening Guide, and uh, he he tried to extract uh, as much money as Post Media did, and so uh, and the paper declined visibly. Uh, you know, it was full of typos. Um, you know, they referred to the Princess of Wales, uh, for instance. Uh, that was one of the worst. And so a bunch of us began meeting over beers, and I was the only. Well, there was another journalist, John Aiken, was involved then, and just some members of the local community, and we be began to um, say, well, this isn't good enough. You know, we're missing news. We're, we're, the people aren't understanding what's happening. Um, uh, you know, let's do something about it. So we invited the editor, and we invited the publisher in for a talk, and we get nowhere. And so we threw $100 in a hat, and we said, we'll, put a, we'll, we'll take out an ad in the paper saying Port Hope deserves a better newspaper. And they took our money, and then the publisher killed the ad before it ran. And we came back licking our wounds, and we said, well, what are we going to do? And one of our members was a businessman, and he said, look, I've, I've, I've worked it all out. We could print an eight-page paper and distribute it to everybody using Canada Post. And, and, and let's take our case to the people and see what they want to do. So we did. And... Uh, we, uh, we decided to sell some ads, and we, we got enough for a second issue, and people said, continue. And so the crier was born, and it was, it was a pretty good local paper. That's what I hope will happen. But um, it's going to take a lot of agitating, a lot, a lot of preparing right now for some communities to mobilize that kind of, uh, you know, uh, group that, that can uh, exert some pressure on Post Media or Metroland or whoever owns the papers to consider local ownership. Because somebody mentioned yesterday, they, they generally sell them all off. Um, and it's, it's more efficient that way. But it's still not gonna be a local owner. And uh, if, if, Metro, if it's Metroland, they'll have a regional daily, uh, a regional weekly with an active website as they do now. and. Um, and that'll miss a lot of people, and, and, and it won't be good enough for Port Hope. So that's what I hope happens. If I could just respond to two points about Post Media um, and their uh, impending bankruptcy. I've, I've heard it said many times this weekend that, oh no, Post, Post Media might go bankrupt. I believe that would be the best possible thing for Canadian journalism. I'm just afraid these hedge funds are too smart for that. They should have gone bankrupt a long time ago, but they voluntarily uh, gave up half of their debt 
so that wouldn't happen. They could do that again and that just ride this thing right down to zero. Meanwhile, they're taking it right off the top at high interest rates of up to 12.5%. Um, so I, I, I just, I, I think that would be a good thing if they went bankrupt, but I'm afraid they won't. Um, what was the point you made about um, post media? I've forgotten, I, I, I've forgotten what point I wanted to respond to of John's, but it'll come back to me, so. Let's take Ian's question. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Ian Gill. I'm uh, with Discourse Media, also author of a book called No News is Bad News. Um, uh, I'm just curious, John, your presentation was fascinating to me because I've written about it, and I think a lot of people have written about the decline, you know, the closure of newspapers and everything else, but the quality, the, you know, the lack of local content um, that you exhibited in your case study was fascinating. Is there any way, you know, there's a Canadian content rule, for instance, in broadcasting uh, that is associated to access to funds for broadcasters. Uh, is there any way to imagine that there should be a local content rule? I mean, the fact that there's a newspaper that has no local editorials, no letters to the editor, and what was it, 89% of the coverage is all wire stories? Um, so isn't there a way through the periodical fund or some subsidy that these papers are getting anyway to actually enforce uh, a, a quantum of local content? I think that's a political football that nobody wants to kick around. Uh, the newspapers are, are largely unregulated, and, and I don't see that changing. Uh, what, what, of course, should happen, and one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to share my, my presentation with the community because um, it's going to come as a surprise that the paper w might be willing to publish letters to the editor uh, uh, after all this, and, and it actually has a website. Um, uh, I think, I think uh, what hopefully will happen is that it'll be community action rather than any kind of macro action. Uh, John, I want to ask, uh, without being too specific, as I was listening to your presentation I guess as an educator of young journalists, uh, I was inwardly cringing and feeling pity for the individual attempting to run that newspaper. So without being specific, who, who are the people who are left holding the bag in this, in this situation? Are they so strapped for time and resources that they, that they they can't act more quickly or more responsibly? What's your impression? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I actually felt sorry for the editor I asked about I, all of this. Um, and and uh, I got him on his day off, his only day off of the week. And he sounded older than I do. I do. <laughs> and I'm 74. Um, uh, he, he assigns and lays out the entire paper every day. He manages the website. And he assigns and edits a, a monthly magazine. Um, he doesn't have time to even think, um, and 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 he's uh, he's got. Uh, what's interesting is somebody mentioned the high churn rate of reporters who work for these papers and they move on as quickly as they can. The two reporters, uh, two of the three reporters, uh, there now were there 20 years ago. So there's a veteran um, reporting presence, at least, and I suspect they, they're, they're largely self-assigned. Uh, but, you know, this, this guy, he really can't do any better, and, and that's why I think Post Media is starving those papers to sell them, and that most of them will close. They won't survive. Um, the, the, you know, Metroland in, in the area already has most of the flyers. It's almost become a... Uh, a, a, a portfolio for flyers, um, and uh, so I think I think it's uh, you know they're not going to get any more resources. Supported as journalists, uh, complicit in the destruction, unwillingly complicit in the destruction of their industry. Mark, it, I, I do, and it relates to Ian's question about local ownership. Uh, John suggested there be some mechanism to encourage local ownership, and this is one of the recommendations that I make in my book, that when Post Media finally implodes, that there be some 
incentives for local ownership, um, government um, matching funds or something, to um, restore what was lost in the beginning. That was the first thing that went, local ownership, when chains started buying up independent dailies across the country, and then chains started buying chains, and now hedge funds are buying chains. If we can somehow unravel this, uh, I think local ownership would be uh, the best possible thing to result from this. Um, John, I had a question about um, social media activities. Uh, did you look at that at all, what they're doing on social media, and are they creating web exclusive content at all, or is it just all going into the, the print bucket? So it's sort of a, a, a staging ground for what they put in the paper. Uh, nothing appears on uh, the website uh, that doesn't appear in the paper eventually. Um, what they do, though, because it's post media, is that they, you know, you look at the website and you say, well, there's this uh, opportunity for for local opinion, and so you click on that, and it's it's from Peterborough, or it's from it's not from the local area at all. So they pool that. Um, uh, just on, in relation to Mark's last point, when we started the crier, lasted about a year and a half. Um, we we made an offer to to Southam to. Um, or to Conrad Black to sell us the paper uh, that we were criticizing. And uh, we got a rather snarky note from Gordon Fisher saying, um, uh, you're, just a, you're just a bunch of left-wing agitators. Um, and so we made up T-shirts, left-wing agitators, <laughs> and so on. It was really great fun. <laughs> of the reading, consuming population. It's very encouraging. Uh, John's career as a troublemaker, if not a left-wing agitator. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mark's notes of hope about ways to tackle this, uh, this phenomenon that say when I graduated from Ryerson quite some years ago, corporate concentration of media ownership was the most important and pressing problem of the day. So that's a lesson to touch on. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, I invite you